Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a minute. We're going to give everybody another minute or two to uh, get logged on. Sit tight. We'll start in a minute. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this important webinar today. I am Jose Sogard, Deputy Director for the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are a liaison between the city and the nightlife industry of businesses, workers, performers, and patrons. We work to support the nightlife community navigating city bureaucracy, improve quality of life and community relations, promote safety and harm reduction, and elevate nightlife culture. If you have any questions or issues about matters um, related to this webinar or anything else related to nightlife, please always feel free to reach out to us at nightlife at media.nyc.gov, or you can follow us on socials at nycnightlife.gov. So today's webinar is part of a new series of courses uh, we created called Night School or Nightlife Industry Training and Education, uh, which will be held both virtually and in person. This is a series to share resources and trainings for owners, workers, and patrons addressing how to best engage with city agencies while opening and operating nightlife businesses, proactive harm reduction and bystander intervention, quality of life issues, and much, much more. You can find out more information at nyc.gov slash night school. That's N-I-T-E school. And we will put that link in the chat. Uh, today, we're very happy to share with you some financial management resources and services from our partners at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and their Office of Financial Empowerment as well as their partners at Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. And we know that so many New Yorkers working and performing in nightlife, it can be challenging to find time between your gigs and shifts to manage and make sense of your finances. And so today we're very excited to connect you with our partners who are providing free one-on-one -on -one professional counseling to help you do just that. And in just a moment, they'll be sharing a presentation with an overview of tools and tips that can help you get started. Before I introduce my colleagues to conduct the training, uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes. First, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to let us know your questions throughout the meeting. And after the presentation, we will have some additional time for Q&A. Uh, there will also be um, some uh, questions for you to answer in, during the presentation uh, when we welcome you to use the chat feature for that as well. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and live streamed to Facebook, and a recording will be available to share with your staff or other colleagues who would like to view uh, the training at a later time. So uh, please share with anyone else you know who might be interested in this information. And again, you can always visit nyc.gov slash night school, that's N-I-T-E school, to find information on other scheduled trainings and webinars as part of this series. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague first from the city's Office of Financial Empowerment. Ariel Munchek Edelman is a program officer of financial counseling and coaching there and will kick us off with some additional background before our colleague Arlene Green, the manager of financial counseling and coaching programs at bed -Stuy Restoration, gives today's presentation. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Ariel, take it away. 
Thank you so much, Jose. Um, I'm really excited to be here and excited to see so many attendees. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I'm really excited about this webinar is I actually was a nightlife worker myself before I joined the Office of Financial Empowerment for several years. I was a drag performer and a barista. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't in New York City, so I didn't have access to some of the really awesome free public resources that exist here, um, which we'll learn about in just a minute. Um, but yeah, if you um, have any questions about financial empowerment services in the city, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, and I'm really excited to turn it over to Erlene Green, who, as Jose mentioned, is um, a manager of financial counseling programs at Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation and actually a financial counselor herself as well. Um, so Erlene, I'm going to uh, share my screen here with the presentation and turn it over to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ariel. And welcome everyone to today's webinar on financial management. Um, I'm excited to be with you today. So uh, let us just get started. But let me just give you a little more information about restoration. Uh, we are uh, the um, first uh, community development organization with a 56 year track record um, serving residents um, in the borough of Brooklyn and our Center for Personal Financial Health is like a one stop multi service hub where we promote economic self sufficiency and financial stability. Um, for families while providing for them an opportunity to um, move upward in their finances. And, um, you know, we, we are like a pipeline sort of of services, um, including workforce readiness, training, job placements, um, benefits, um, screening and enrollment, um, and of course, financial counseling, um, employment and home ownership services. And we help our clients to develop um, asset, assets, right? And so um, I'd like to say that our services help our customers um, along their financial journey where we meet clients where they are and we help them to navigate uh, through the process of becoming um, or through the process of, of being financially vulnerable to financially coping to eventually being financially stable. So um, that's just a little bit about who we are in terms of restoration. So we can now go to that third slide and get started. And you will see that, um, you know, nightlife, um, um, has a unique set of circumstances or opportunities and challenges, I should say, as the slide says. Um, so I'd like to just take a moment to ask you to respond to the questions on the slide. Um, um, Ariel um, talked about his experience, and now I'd like you to kind of just share a little bit about your experience in terms of um, some of the challenges that, that you may have faced. And also, um, please share with us um, any of the any financial topics that you feel would be helpful to you moving forward okay you could um, type that um, in the in the chat thank you so um while we um, talk about or while you may be um, putting some information in the chat about some of the challenges that you face as a nightlife worker. Um, I want to also talk about um, the fact that um, there are some um, um, opportunities also um, that exist in nightlife. I was just reading um, some information from the Mayor's Office of Entertainment and Media, and they did an economic impact study of nightlife and um, it revealed that nightlife supports um, over 299,000 jobs, um, resulting in $13.1 billion in employee compensation. So that was good news for me um, because clearly um, nightlife um, workers uh, a growing um, faster, or if not as fast as the rest of the economy in New York City. So, um, you know, there's the data to support that. Um, and, and 
in doing that, we know that um, such as because it's a growing economy uh, that we can um, dedicate more time and support uh, to manage this industry and help nightlife workers to overcome some of those challenges. So uh, let us go to slide five. Um, so this is what we are going to cover today. Understanding your relationship with money, financial management strategies, how to make the most out of your assets how to minimize your liabilities. And um, then you will also learn how to access, um, access the confidential free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling session at the um, financial empowerment centers, okay? So personal financial management, what it is, okay? So personal financial management, I think we are, um, on the slide before this one, Ariel. Yes, there you go. Thank you. So personal financial management, as you see, is the process of planning and budgeting for how your money is saved or spent. It's managing your personal finances um, in a way that will help us to set goals, to save, um, save for various reasons, including retirement, um, and it is a crucial, it is critical in our ability to effectively manage um, exactly what is coming in in terms of our income and what is going out in terms of our expenses and how to um, save and how to invest as well. And so this is especially important um, when we have um, variable income, um, as many of us do in nightlife work, right? Because if you are a nightlife business owner, um, without sound, sound financial management, you're likely to make um, the kind of mistakes that can cost you your business, um, or that can cause you to even mismanage your finances, resulting in minimal and not maximum profits. Um, it can also cause you to mismanage your finances and cause you to not be able to uh, pay your employees on time. I have been in situations like that as well. Um, but if you are an employee practicing financial uh, management principles enables you to um, take control of your finances to save and to plan for the future. So we're gonna to go to the next slide, which um, depicts three major components of personal financial management. And the first one is a budget. Second one is goals. And the third one um, is savings. So when we talk about budgeting, um, budgeting is simply a spending plan to help us to balance our income, our expenses, and um, our financial goals for a specific period of time. And so a budget will help us to track our spending and ensure that we are living within our means. It, it's a way of helping uh, us to keep control of our money um, so that our money doesn't control us. And so when we look at budgeting, we look at, um, again, um, uh, the need to... Uh, total up all of our income, right? Many of us have income from various sources. So you total up all of your income from various sources, whether it's from a full-time job, part-time job, um, whether it's portfolio income or interest income, or even tips that you receive, right? Um, you total all of those up for the month, and then you minus all of your expenses, um, your fixed expenses, your variable expenses, and even periodic expenses. And so um, what's left over after you deduct your expenses from your total income is 
known as cash flow, right? So um, in the end, you can have a negative cash flow, which means that your expenses exceeds your income, or you can have a positive cash flow, which means that your income exceeds your expenses and you have some money left over to do some other things, right? Um, but depending on how much you have left over, you know, you could create a plan to, um, you know, um, to save or to invest or to um, make some kind of major purchase, right? But I want to also um, uh, mention that when you um, uh, do your budget, you can also find yourself at a place where you are breaking even, right? So um, to break even means that you are spending everything that you actually earn and that there is nothing left over. Um, and so you just have enough money to meet your expenses. And this is really the epitome of what is known as living from paycheck to paycheck, right? Or living on an earn and spend treadmill. And I don't know about you, but I have definitely been there and done that, right? And not looking forward to, to going back to that place. Okay, so um, that sums it up for the budget. So let's look at SMART goals. Um, when you create a viable budget, we, we give ourselves the best chance of being able to save and achieve our goals. Um, so let's just look at um, the SMART goal component and exactly what it is. So uh, we know that a goal is um, a destination or something that we want or need. Um, which will require us to take some kind of action to achieve it. And I, um, I always uh, indicate when I tell that to people, I always say that it is definitely different than a dream um, because people use dreams and goals um, synonymously, but they are really different. Um, goals is an object of effort. It's something you have to work toward. A dream are images and thoughts and visions, and you can have them, but you don't have to put any effort toward achieving them, right? So when we talk about a goal, we think about and we um, we, we think about um, it providing goals, providing a sense of direction, motivation, and, and some kind of clear focus. Um, and it helps us to kind of clarify um, our importance in terms of, not an importance, but um, our priorities, I should say, okay? Um, and so when we think about SMART goals, it is used to help us um, to set goals in a way um, that is viable, right? So it's an acronym. SMART is an acronym. It means specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And um, we incorporate these criteria to help us to focus our efforts and increase the chances of us achieving our goals. And so I would, what I want to do now is just really just give you um, some idea of what the, the acronym stand for, um, because it's important when you sit down and write these SMART goals. So the um, specific is when your goal is well-defined, it's clear, it's unambiguous. Um, for instance, when you sit down and write your goal, um, saying I want to spend my spring break at Daytona Beach versus I want to do something over the spring break, right? The first one is more specific. It's clear. It tells you where you want to spend your spring break because knowing where you want to spend your spring break is going to inform um, all of your um following decisions. Measurable, the M, is when your goal is capable of being measured. It answers the question, how much do you need to accomplish this goal? For example, I need $120 for my share of the gas, hotel, and food for the week versus I'm going to need some money for the trip, right? So you want your goal to be measurable, you want to understand how much it's going to cost. Um, achievable. Uh, this is when your goal has the ability to be achieved. It's not something that is impossible, right? So for instance, I'll say $15 a week from Thanksgiving until spring break or um, 
or I should say versus I'll win a weekly radio um, talk show contest to get the money to pay for the trip, right? So um, with that second one, there are no guarantees. It's a long shot, right? So um, because of that, it may not be achievable and it's unlikely that it will be achievable, right? So your goal has to be achievable, um, realistic. It has to be real to life. It has to be relevant and within your reach. It has to be real um, um, practical, Right. So, for example, I plan to drive from New York to Miami, Florida, um, uh, 20 hours uh, using four drivers versus I want to drive from New York to Miami in eight hours. Right. That is not possible. Realistically, that is not possible. Right. Um, so um, unless you're going in the airplane, of course, but it's going to take you a, a lot less time. But I'm talking about driving specifically. Um, and then we have time bound. Right. Which is a clearly defined timeline, including a start date and a target date. And the purpose of the timeline is really to help you to create a period of duration, because a period of duration will give give you a sense of urgency um, so that you don't prolong your, your goals, so that you um, start working toward it. And the goals can be short-term um, within six to one year. It can be long-term, one to five years, and it can be five years, right? And so um, often individuals um, or businesses will set themselves up for failure by setting general and unrealistic goals, right? Goals that are vague and have no sense of direction. So we want to avoid doing that. Um, and so, you know, again, the SMART goals set us up for success by making our goals um, um, focused, right? It helps um, push us further um, in the direction that we want to go and it helps us to organize and to be able to reach our goals. And then we have savings, right? And this is another component or a principle of um, financial management. And when it comes to saving, there's no one thing that that we should, that when, when it comes to saving, there is one thing um, that we should acknowledge um, about ourselves. And that is whether or not we are, or we consider ourselves to be a saver or a spender. So that's a good question that you can ask yourself, which one am Am I? am I a saver or am I a spender? You can put that in the chat too. Are you a, are you a spender or are you a saver? Um, and, and, and knowing the answer to this question is important for several reasons. Um, the first reason is because it gives us a good way to um, determine um, our relationship with money. Uh, the second is that it speaks to our attitudes and our actions regarding money and it can also help us to um, change some bad habits and to um, replace them with, with some good ones, right? And so here's what we know about a spender. If you are a spender, um, you know, we, we, we love money for the things that it can buy, right? Um, and uh, we would also prefer to have something concrete and tangible like a car or trendy gadgets or technology over having something as abstract. Um, such as savings, right? And so, um, and we know that that savers are, are lifesavers, really, right? Um, because, um, you know, they, um, they are the ones that we borrow from, from the most part, right? And savers um, create a fortune um, in the bank very quickly. Uh, but while still living a comfortable life, um, you know, and, and while still, um, being on a tight budget. Um, my brother is that way. And, and we used to call him a penny pincher. We used to call him cheap. But um, as I learned more about finances, I learned that he is frugal and he is responsible with his money. And so, um, so, and, and, and you may very well be someone who is, um, not a spender or a saver, but you can be both, right? And because you're both, you may have 
um, or you may do a really great job balancing between the two, right? Balancing between being a spender and a saver. But the point here is really for us to acknowledge where we fit in and then determine if where we are is where we really want to be, right? Because um, the, the question is, wherever I am, is it working for me or is it working against me? Is it leading me towards my goal, um, towards my desires and plans for the future, or is it moving uh, me away from it, right? Um, or am I able to save for that house? that pension, um, my children's education, that vacation, um, my children's education, that vacation, or um, even medical expenses, right? So um, I think for, for nightlife workers, um, some of you may be faced with the challenge of inconsistent income and may rely more heavily on tips and other compensations. But um, I, and, and, and that might be uh, a reason why you, may not put so much effort into savings, but I want to encourage you um, to, to really make savings a priority because it's not really how much you save um, from every paycheck that makes a difference. It's really how consistent you are with saving, right? So being consistent helps us to develop uh, good habits of, of savings. Therefore, when you are able to save more, you will be more willing to do so because you have already um, developed the habit of, of saving. And remember, um, you know, responsible spending enables us to live within our means. And to live within our means, um, in order to do that, we must spend less and um, and then make and save as much as we can, right? Okay, so we're gonna go to the next slide, slide seven. And this kind of ties everything together um, as a way for us to really understand and control our finances, right? So um, here we have a list of, 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 of things that we can do. And um, one of them, I'm just going to put a little emphasis on some of them, not all of them, um, reduce monthly spending. And really, this is about budgeting, right? Um, what we already talked about, because in order to reduce our expenses, we need to track them and to determine what we can reduce and or eliminate from our budget in order to put more money back into our budget so that we can um, use that money for other priorities, right? Right. And so um, then we have paying off debt. And this is also related to spending, right? Because uh, when we have little uh, to no debt, we get to keep more of what we earn. Then we'll be able to do more with our earnings. So um, this is a really important um, step to take um, to help us to control our finances. And then um, um, exploring ways to invest our money, right? Um, this is related more to setting um, smart goals, right? Understanding our destination or, or plans for the future and making our money work for us and not against us. And so this is really about allowing our money to grow and to get a good return on our investment. Um, it, it, it will allow us to, to buy assets or financial products that will eventually appreciate and not depreciate, right? And so I wanna just take a minute to, to, to talk more about investing because it, we are in a time now um, where the idea of investing um, is, 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 co is, is closely correlated to um, our I, to, uh, to what we'll, we'll, we, we are experiencing right now, right? And that's inflation. So when we invest, um, we believe that we are buying an asset that will generate a return over a period of time. So the main reason um, we invest is really to, to grow our money. And of course, with, with investing, there are no guarantees and most investors are, are better suited for the long term um, rather than the short term. And when I say the long term, I mean for retirement or purchasing a home, um, something like that, right? Um, but 
um, there are no guarantees. Um, so why do people uh, choose to invest in addition to, not at the exclusion of, but in addition to savings, right? And so the answer is, has to do with um, the increase really of the cost of living over a period of time. And this is known as inflation, right? And, and again, we are really feeling the sting of that these days. So while savings is, is good, for the short term, they typically don't generate uh, the return beyond the level of inflation, right? Um, in fact, they often lag inflation, <clears throat> excuse me. So that can mean that our money is not just standing still um, in, in our savings, but it can also be losing its purchasing power over a period of time. And so the goal of every investor should be to um, outpace inflation so that our money can generate a solid um, real return. Um, and that's the, the, the return after inflation, right? So while most investments, again, don't guarantee, don't make any guarantees, they generally offer the potential to beat inflation. And that's what we're looking for, the kind of investments that will beat inflation. So saving and investing really go hand in hand and they can um, and, and they both have their place in our um, financial um, management plan, okay? Um, another important aspect of financial management is understanding our relationship with money. And so this particular slide, um, Ariel, you can move to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so when we took when we talk about relationship with money, um, we're looking at um uh and, and, and this is interesting. I want to preface um, this slide by saying that when we think of relationships, we often think of interactions with people, right? Um, but um, our life experiences teaches us that relationships um, can be healthy, um, it can be unhealthy, and it can be um, toxic. Right. And and usually when we think of it in terms of that, we think about it when we are in relationship with each other. However, um, we rarely consider um, whether our relationship with money can have the same effect or impact or could be the same. Right. Um, so why is having a good relationship with money important? Um, it's important because it's really a part of our overall well-being, right? Um, being financially well includes having a relationship with money that makes us feel satisfied um, and content and not stressed out all the time, you know? Um, I've read so many reports that said money um, is the leading cause of, of stress for adults, right? And an unhealthy relationship with money can cause to um, it can it it can result in um, uh, depression, um, divorce, um, bankruptcy, and so on. Right. So, uh, what we want to do is now is just look at th the difference between healthy and unhealthy relationship. So, on the unhealthy relationship, we see um, an example of that would be when you spend more money <clears throat> when you when you when you're spending money. Um, because it, but when you're spending money, it makes you feel guilty. Sorry. Um, so when you spend money, it makes you feel guilty. Um, when you spend money, um, you spend more than what you make. Um, and then you have to borrow money to take care of your responsibilities. Um, unhealthy relationship uh, is when you spend money carelessly without giving any thought to how you're spending your money and without even planning uh, to spend your money. Um, it's when you are overwhelmed with credit card debt. And, um, and although that is the case, you just keep digging and digging yourself deeper and deeper in debt. It's when you feel that you have to spend your money in order to enjoy life. And then you find yourself overspending um, because you don't really have any control. Um, you feel the need to spend as much as people around you, right? And so that's um, um, uh, 
it's that that has to do with with keeping up with the Joneses, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, so when we're talking about a healthy relationship with money, um, an example of that would be when you monitor your spending and have control over it. Um, Ariel, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and then you use money to achieve your goals. Um, you save regularly, even a little, and have an emergency um, fund. Uh, you build assets and you minimize your expenses. You use credit as leverage and not as a crutch, right? So um, an, an unhealthy, in, in summary, uh, unhealthy uh, relationship can be detrimental, right? Um, and an unhealthy relationship will more than likely land you in trouble and even cause you some anguish, right? But a healthy relationship with money means that earning and spending and managing it will, will not cause financial difficulties for you and, and that uh, we are reasonably content uh, with our relationship because we feel in control of it. And we feel that it's doing for us what we desire for it to do. And um, uh, the good thing is that when we can learn to focus on changing unhealthy money habits or relationships um, with money, um, we can reinforce a healthy one um, as well with our money, right? Um, so where we are today, um, is not necessarily where we have to be tomorrow. Uh, we can make choices um, to be in a healthy relationship with our money and to effectively manage our money in a way that will help us to plan the kind of future for ourselves that we want to have, okay? Um, let's go to slide 11. Um, and so we're going to talk about values and how that impacts our relationship with money. And so our upbringing and experiences and values are often what determines the kind of relationship that we're going to have with our money. Um, so a question that um, I'd like for you to answer in the chat is, what are your values? when it comes to your finances? And how do your values factor into your decisions around money? Okay, um, these questions are really important. So I would really urge you to, to answer that. If you can't do it now, um, then uh, just think about it and um, see what you come up with, right? Um, so our relationship with money, um, it's formed in many ways, right? It's formed by our observations and the messages that we see and hear that is related to money. And according to a, a PBS report, um, children can understand um, basic concepts um, about money um, starting as early as three years old um, and by seven, definitely. Um, and I can attest to this because I used to do um, um, investing and financial training with young people in junior high, uh, in, in public school. And uh, they were able to get those concepts and understand them, right? Um, but our early experiences with money, such as witnessing, arguing in the household about money or being defined by money, um, um, it can trigger a range of emotions such as anxiety, resentment, or feelings of elit elitism, right, um, that we may carry with us through life. And so those experiences and those emotions um, can help shape and they usually do help shape our relationship with money. And based on our values, um, money can make us money can make us feel insecure. Um, it can make us feel secure too, right? Um, and, and as we provide not only for ourselves but for our family, and um, even our joy can come from the sacrifices that we make with money. And money can also, um, you know, make us feel insecure when we um, don't have it, right? And when we don't have the things that we want, 
Um, it can um, affect us negatively and it may um, encourage some envy or maybe even corruption or maybe even um, some resentment toward those who may have a little more than we do. And it can also position us to be overly um, socially competitive, right? Um, by feeling the need to really keep up with the Joneses. Um, I had a pastor uh, that and, and I love the way he put this when he talked about keeping up with the Joneses. He says, we spend money um, that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like, right? So giving people a false sense of impression of ourselves and um, it, it, it only serves to keep us deep in debt and causes us to, to keep less of what we earn, right? So uh, let's, let's be real about our money, at least to ourselves, and let's um, respond to what we have accordingly, right? So um, let's see. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, when we have a healthy relationship with our money, we are willing to be honest with ourselves and to fully understand our financial um, position, right? So some of us don't want to um, know um, what our financial position is really because uh, we have a, a a, although we have a good sense of it, uh, we really don't want to look at the true reality of where we stand um, because we may not be in such a good place, right? Um, so sometimes we ignore the financial numbers, which really tells us about our financial well being. And so it's important to know our numbers. And when we talk about knowing our numbers, we're talking about knowing your cash flow. We talked about that. Um, your net worth, your FICO score, your credit utilization, and your income to debt ratio, right? And so um, when we're talking about cash flow, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is simply... Um, we're going to go, yes, thank you. So we're going to go to, uh, so we're talking about when we talk about cash flow, again, we're talking about money coming in and out not only of our household, but um, out of our business as well, right? From month to month. Um, and whatever's left over um, is our net cash flow, just like on the budget sheet, right? So we look at what's coming in and we look at what's going out and we look at what's, what's left over. And if you have a business, the best way to keep track of your cash flow in your business is to run a cash flow report. And this report shows the cash you receive and the cash paid out um, to show your, your, your business's um, cash position at the end of every month. Um, but there may be a need for a business not only to do this at the end of every month, um, but to keep track um, of your cash flow on a weekly basis or even on a daily basis to really um, stay on top of it and to track it to help you to make day-to-day -day decisions, right? Um, the next slide is our net worth. Uh, and this is the combination of what you own, um, your assets, and what you owe, which are your liabilities, right? And so in our financial counseling sessions, uh, we use a balance sheet to help clients to determine their net worth. And so as you see in this graphic here, it reflects an unbalanced scale. And in this case, the person has more assets than liabilities, which is where we should all strive to be, right? We want to have more assets um, than our liabilities. And so um, our net worth is just the value of all of our assets minus the total of all of our liabilities. So knowing this number, again, can help us to make financial decisions about our future and about our financial stability, right? It's, it's helpful to help us to stay on track. Um, and I'll just talk about briefly just ways that we can increase our network, our net worth. We can pay off our debt, our credit card debt. This is the best way to grow our assets, right? Um, and increase our network. Um, 
um, because it will eliminate all of those high interest um, um, credit card debts and loans that we have, right? Another way is to build an emergency fund. Um, this is going to also <clears throat> help us to um, grow our assets and increase our network because um, creating an emergency fund is going to help us to stay financially afloat without having to rely on um, other money um, and especially high interest, uh, accumulating high interest debt from credit cards or expensive personal loans. When we have an emergency fund, we can go to that to that um, fund uh, to pay for the emergency as opposed to putting it again on a high interest credit card or um, take out a personal loan for that. And we know the interest rate today on both are extremely high, right? So we wanna stay away from that. Um, and then another way is to consider maxing out, maxing out our retirement contributions, taking advantage of these accounts and keeping as much invested in our retirement as possible, especially when your employee um, your employer is contributing. You want to at least um, max out on your specific contributions. And another way is paying off your student loans um, and, 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 and invest um, um, as well, okay? Paying off your student loans and get into um, whatever investment opportunities you can. The next one is your FICO score. We know that this is an important number um, because it helps lenders to assess how well you manage your financial obligations. And this number is determined by credit agencies based on the information from my credit report. And it's made up of five different components. 35% is based on our payment history. So that's why we wanna make sure that we pay as much as we can and always pay on time. 30% is our total um, amount that is owed and that is reflective of our debt to credit ratio and or credit utilization ratio. Um, they're both the same, but this is a, a reflection of how much credit we are using. For example, if you have um, uh, $2,000 in outstanding debt, but uh, you have $10,000 in available credit line, right? Um, that's only a 20% uh, debt to credit ratio or credit utilization ratio. Uh, you divide the um, the the tw the two thousand by by ten thousand, and you get the percentage right. And we we show you more about that um, toward the end. But using, I want you to keep this in mind that when you are using your available credit, if you use more than thirty percent of your available credit uh, limit. Uh, it is going to um, um, cause a reduction in your um, FICO score. It's going to decrease it, right? So whenever you're using uh, your credit, uh, try to uh, use less than 30% of it so that you can get the maximum um, FICO score, right? And we know that our FICO score ranges from 300 to 850. And this is really an important number um, for our financial success, right? So if, if, if you have a very good to excellent score, it can open up doors um, to loans at the best rates. Um, you can get higher credit limits. Uh, you can, it can open you up to job opportunities. It can give you access to additional credit for major purchases. Um, and so your credit worthiness is an advantage to you and it can save you thousands and thousands of dollars in the end. Um, credit utilization ratio, that's what we just spoke about. Um, so again, your total credit utilization is the sum of all of your balances divided by the sum of your credit card limits. And um, you, again, want to keep it uh, below uh, 30%. Um, below 30% because anything above will negatively affect it, okay? So it's the 800, which is your balance um, and your 4,000 is your credit limit. So you're using 20% and um, vice versa, you would be using 40% in the other example, right? Um, so let's go on to the next slide. 
And here we talk about, um, let's see, let's talk about ways to manage um, our assets, ways to manage our assets. Okay. There was another slide in there. I didn't see that one. Okay. Okay. So here's a debt to income ratio, um, which is the same as the credit utilization. So that slide didn't necessarily have to be in there. So forgive me for that. Um, so we're going to go to ways to manage assets, and there are several ways. Um, first of all, identify your assets. Know what your assets are. Um, you know, keep them written in the book. Keep them on a spreadsheet. Know how to um, access access them immediately um, when you need to. Um, assign value to your assets. What are your value? Your, your, what are the, what are the, what are the values? Um, the value that um, your assets carry um, at this point, and even um, look at um, an appreciation value as well. Um, Ensure and or protect your assets. You don't want anything to get in the way of, of you losing um, your assets or it not being protected. So that's important that you do that. Understand your assets and your taxes, right? Your liability and create a plan to leverage your assets. So when we, when we manage our assets well, um, we, we can use it to accumulate more assets, right? Which will bring us greater value and um, add to our growth um, portfolio, right? Um, now, <clears throat> expanding our, F, our access, our assets, expanding our assets is um, important, right? And we can um, um, expand it um, for instance, if you are really wanting to put um, $20,000 to work um, investing in real estate, right, um, you can uh, put all of that in, in one basket, but we've learned, right, how important it is to diversify, right? So um, we could instead use the $20,000 put 20% down on five different properties of the same value. And at the same time, um, $10,000 profit per house, but we can actually um, use again, that $20,000 to leverage um, that money and purchase um, more assets, right? And so um, this is just something to, to think about when you are considering um, 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 uh, managing your assets, not considering, hopefully you will, right? Um, but when you're considering creating a plan um, to manage your assets, and again, this is um, um, a way for you to, to leverage your assets, use what you have and capitalize on it so that it can create more assets for you, okay? Um, that's the power of leveraging. And then um, the other slide is ways to manage your liabilities. And um, these are just several ways that we already discussed, um, but minimizing our liabilities simply means increasing our numbers, right? Making sure that our numbers, our financial numbers are working for us. So uh, we want to increase our cash flow, um, our FICO score, our network, and, um, and, and we want to be in a position to increase our assets. So all around, um, if we are managing our liabilities um, effectively, it's going to be a win-win situation, and it's going to create um, the road of financial stability and wealth for us, right? Um, so the, the one point I, I do uh, want to emphasize here is um, for... I would I would encourage um, you to seek the advice and help from a financial counselor, right? We're here to support you and to help you to develop strategies for savings, 
increasing your FICO score, paying down your debt, addressing collection accounts and your student loan debt. And um, all of this is at no cost to you. We also have community partners who uh, we can refer you to, who also free of charge will support you um, in other ways, such as our partnership with the um, Foundation for Financial Planning, where you can meet with a certified um, financial planner to discuss investment opportunities, retirement planning, insurance, taxes, estate planning, and et cetera. Um, we also have um, partnership with um, the New York Legal Assistant Group, and they help our clients um, to navigate um, consumer debt uh, collection accounts, and, and especially when it's in um, civil court. So, um, you know, speaking with the financial counselor can can really uh, uh, benefit you, and um, uh, we can definitely help support you to uh, support you on your journey to for financial freedom or financial stability, whatever um, the goal is for you is different for everyone. So I think that is it for us. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ariel at this point. Ariel, you can take Thank it away. Thank you so much, Erlene. <laughs> um, it was really You're fantastic. Um, we have here just a few highlights of the various consumer protection um, and consumer support agencies um, that are available to you as residents of New York City. Um, there is the statewide um, the Department of Financial Services. There is the federal uh, FTC. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has tons of resources um, that are extremely useful. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, uh, where I work, and uh, Restoration, where Erlene works. Um, the last thing I want to highlight here is uh, the financial empowerment centers, which Erlene mentioned a number of times. Um, these centers offer free professional, confidential, and one-on-one -on -one financial counseling to anyone who is 18 or older and lives or works in New York City. There's no income restrictions. There's no immigration status restrictions. We have services both in person and over the phone. Um, we have over 30 sites right now operating across the city. Um, so if you want that face-to-face -face interaction that can be so helpful, um, there's lots of options to do that. And collectively, um, over time, we've helped New Yorkers reduce their debt by, I actually believe this is almost at 100 million right now, if it hasn't already passed that, um, and build more than 11 million in savings. Um, so as you can see, you can schedule an appointment by going to nyc.gov slash talk money, and then you click the book an appointment button. Or if you're more comfortable uh, scheduling via the phone, you can call 311 um, and schedule that way. Just say uh, that you're looking for financial counseling. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we do have time for just a few minutes for questions now. Um, one thing I do want to highlight um, is Erlene's contact information. Um, Erlene is one of our most experienced managers and counselors. Um, if you would like to meet with Erlene specifically, you can give her uh, a call or email here. Um, but uh, because uh, Erlene works for Bedford Stuyvesant and Restoration, um, you know, their services are only in Brooklyn. Um, so we have, you know, other services across the city as well. Um, if, are there any questions? Uh, you can feel free to put those in the q and I answered one already. Um, Erlene, I guess, do you have any, uh, regarding the question that was asked, do you have any particular advice on managing a budget with multiple streams of income? What, what I personally will say um, is, you know, obviously a, a budget with multiple streams of income or with variable income month to month is definitely more complex than a budget where, you know, if you have a salary job where you're getting a consistent amount every month, but it's still really helpful to create kind of a, a budget, perhaps like with several ranges. Um, so, you know, if you know that the 
there's like a lower limit to how much you might make in a month and an upper limit based on say how many tips you get or how many gigs you have that month. Um, you know, adjusting, kind of having several different uh, versions of that budget with the same items is one way that you can, um, you know, manage that kind of variability or multiple sources. Thanks so much, Ariel. I, while we're waiting for any last questions to come in, um, I'm wondering if I can just ask you to um, read out the other answer you gave about the other resources your agency is providing just for the benefit of folks who might be viewing the webinar um, at a later time. Absolutely. Um, so there was a question asked about um, tax preparation and about advocating um, for untimely pay or, or rather against untimely pay. Um, so there are I'm I do not work in the Office of uh, Labor Policy, but there are a number of laws um, that are New York City specific regarding um, you know what your your pay schedule has to be how quickly you can be paid or you have to be paid um, after particularly um, a, a freelance gig um, so I, I put the link in the q a but i'll put it in the chat as well um, if you search um, if you're watching this and you don't have the um, chat you can just search uh, dcwp that's the department of consumer and worker protection and labor or DCWP and taxes, and those will bring you to the uh, agency pages on those topics. Um, what I will say is that there, um, the laws are very industry specific. So depending on what um, uh, kind of workplace you work at, um, the rules around timely pay, around um, you know at what kind of uh, threshold of a freelance gig. Uh, certain kinds of protections kick in on um, will vary. Um, so I definitely recommend looking at those web pages to, to figure out what applies for your specific, uh, you know, employment situation. That's, that's really terrific. And uh, because we are just about a month out from uh, the tax filing deadline, uh, for those of you who are still looking to file your taxes, please do check out uh, DCWP's uh, uh, free resources for for uh, helping many New Yorkers um, pre uh, prepare and file their taxes. Uh, you you may be eligible, so we really encourage you to to check that out. Um, one thing I'll also add about taxes: the New York City specific free tax program, the income there is an income cutoff, unlike the financial empowerment centers. Um, I believe that cutoff is fifty six thousand dollars a year. Um, but if you make up to seventy three thousand dollars a year, um, you will be eligible for the IRS's free tax prep program. Um, that's kind of unlike these private tax prep quote unquote free tax prep um, applications that you know companies uh, I probably shouldn't say any specific names but uh, certain companies advertise as free that actually hit you with fees after you like enter all your information so just know if you make up to seventy three thousand dollars a year there are fully free publicly available programs for you uh, you know if if only only use those other private companies if you make over that limit that's really helpful advice. Thank you. And um, we do encourage everyone to to check out both of those links. And um, I'm seeing uh, no additional questions in the Q&A. And we're just over um, our uh, 1 p.m. cutoff time. So I would like to uh, thank both Ariel and Erlene so very much for uh, putting together this really helpful and informative webinar. Um, and for everyone who has joined us today, we, we really hope you've been able to um, take some helpful information away from this session um, and that you uh, will be able to take advantage of the resources and services from the Financial Empowerment Centers, as well as some of the other offerings um, by the Department of Consumer Worker Protection and their partners. So thank you very much uh, everyone for uh, attending today. As always, feel free to contact the Office of Nightlife via email or social media. That's nightlifeandmedia.nyc.gov or at nycnightlifegov on social media. 
we will leave the meeting up just for another couple of minutes uh, for you to be able to grab any links or, or other um, items from the chat that you may need. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.